Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, this seems like a highly polemical and controversial uh, subject and presentation, and I assure you it's going to be one. Uh, but I can also assure you that this is in no way meant to be an attack on women's rights. Uh, this is just a critique of feminist biology and feminist epistemology, and I think it will be a 15-minute, it's a slightly expanded version of something I'd written, uh, I think, about a year ago. And uh, I'll just run some slides, and after that, we'll open it up, and I'm happy to take your questions. There has been, for a while, a sort of hectoring postmodern critique of biology, particularly from the ranks of academic feminism, also known as gender studies departments, that professors or would like to profess that biology is politics by other means. The essential first principles of the scheme of feminist epistemology or women's ways of knowing are that there are no objective facts. Objectivity is a sort of cover for masculine bias. This is the premise and the credo of uh, feminist epistemology, that objectivity is a cover for masculine bias. All standard criteria for scientific inquiry have been sullied by this aforesaid masculine bias and therefore are inherently sexist and incompatible with women's ways of knowing. There is no such thing as detached, unprejudiced inquiry. Observations are always to be understood as a product of the gender of the observer who made them. In 2014, the University of Wisconsin started North America's first ever postdoctoral program in feminist biology. Feminist biology is the application of feminist theory and methods of study to biology. The program ostensibly is meant to uncover and reverse gender bias in biological theory which is brilliant, and above all, uh, in the service of Karl Marx's favorite motto, which is the omnibus dubitandum, which means everything must be doubted. The truth obviously cannot be sexist, and all that androcentric patriarchal bias must be hunted down, shot in the head, and strung up for all to see. But the laying of the axe to the root of masculine bias, if at all, must mean more than attacking gender-laden language. Gender-laden language and metaphor in biology about the egg being passive that does not move or journey and the sperm being streamlined and moving in strong lurches to burrow through the egg coat and penetrate it, or masculine terms and the description of menstruation as the debris of the uterine lining, which is uh, borrowed from this paper, which is Emily Martin's rant in a paper called How Science Has Deconstructed a Romance Based on Stereotypical Male-Female Roles. That, in my view, is a hop, skip and jump away from Sandra Hardin's description of Newton's Principia as a rape manual. So Sandra Harding described Newton's Principia as a rape manual. And uh, as we can see it here, I don't know, is this, is this legible from, for the audience? It's not. Oh dear. Uh, well, there's nothing we can do about that. But that is, as I said, uh, Sandra Harding's description of Newton's Principia as a rape manual. Mathematics has been challenged as a masculine, as, as a product of masculine provenism and masculine linear thinking and so on. And uh, this is Luz Irrigary, who asserted once that E is equal to mc square 
was a sexed equation because it privileges the speed of light over other speeds vitally necessary to us. Now, I think it can be reasonably stated that feminism is not a science. And because it's not a science, it, not, it is not held to the requirements of science. Feminist biologists must not insist, like their foremother Sandra Harding, that models of objective science are only those studies that are explicitly directed by morally and politically emancipatory interests. The most famous postmodernist grouse is against evolutionary psychology and sexual selection. Feminist biologists believe that evolutionary psychology and sexual selection are kind of hand-knitted theories that constitute the lowest form of casualty and seem to have an affinity of casting female processes in an unflattering light. Apart from being deterministic and reductionist and morally irresponsible, uh, sexual selection and evolutionary psychology can qualify as mansplaining. What can also be reasonably stated is that a form of behavior that has its basis in biology does nothing to endorse it. Just because it's there in nature doesn't necessarily make it morally right or correct. No amount of opaque, constructivist, and post-structuralist language should be allowed to pervert and misrepresent that very basic disclaimer. To demonstrate the unflattering light on female processes, I'm going to very briefly take you through the meadows of biological theory, and I'll give you the long view provided by evolutionary biology. And I invite you to respond by, by telling me if you think this is unflattering to women. I refer you to two splendid papers in preeclampsia by Jennifer Davis and Gordon Gallup. This was in 2006 and 2008, respectively. And what these papers tried to demonstrate, tried to explain, was what is the evolutionary purpose and the evolutionary meaning of a young woman dying with convulsions during childbirth? Now, there's a condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a disorder of pregnancy that, if allowed to go untreated, can produce a malignant form of elevated blood pressure, hypertension. It can cause protein loss in urine, and in the worst cases, can cause convulsions endangering the life of the woman and very messily aborting the fetus. The only definitive way of reversing it is by delivering or aborting the fetus. Now, the narrative on the pathogenesis of this condition, preeclampsia, goes something like this. Preeclampsia is a condition almost exclusive to humans on account of the large head size of the baby, of the fetus. The human fetal brain requires 60% of total maternal nutritional supplies in the womb, as opposed to 20% of maternal nutritional supplies for the other 4,300 species of mammals. All mammalian embryos are implanted in the womb shortly after conception, but it's only in humans, it's the only species, to undergo a deeper invasion towards the end of the first trimester provide an increase in blood supply and nutrition required for the large size of the human head. So there's a deeper invasion of the placental tissue into the uterus, which is only seen in humans. Now, this deeper invasion requires a dropping of the immunolo immunological guard on the part of the female, on the part of the mother, because the fetus is alien tissue. So in order to accept this deeper invasion of this tissue, there is a requirement for dropping of the immunological guard. And uh, this happens by a process which is called familiarization of the sperm, a sort of habituation to paternal antigens by frequent insemination. So the theory goes something like this, that in order for the fetus to be completely accepted, there has to be a dropping of the immunological guard. For that, there has to be someone to familiarization of tissue. 
the more the number of uh, inseminations prior to conception, the better the chance of familiarization of the tissue, the better the chance of the survival of the fetus. Uh, fetus. What is the evidence for this? If, I, if you were to ask me, how, how can I say that familiarization of sperm is associated with lesser chances of preeclampsia? This is the evidence. Preeclampsia occurs in 40% of primary gravids, which means that women who are first time pregnant, who have had less than four months of sexual cohabitation prior to conception. It happens in 25% of those with five to eight months of cohabitation, in 15% of those with nine to 12 months of sexual cohabitation, and in 5% of those more than 12 months. It's almost never seen in multigravids, in subsequent pregnancies, unless these are women who have changed their sexual partners. It's very often referred to as a couple's disease. Now, These papers by Jennifer Davis and Gordon Gallup, they deliver their summa in the following manner. They say, guided by, guided by an evolutionary perspective, we contend that unfamiliar semen may be a biological correlate of paternal investment. What does that mean? It means evolutionarily, Pregnancies in children that result from unfamiliar semen have a lower probability of receiving sufficient paternal investment than those resulting from familiar semen. So, these authors theorize that preeclampsia is a biological mechanism that evolved to terminate maternal investment under circumstances in which the likelihood of paternal investment by the father was doubtful. Frequent insemination by the same male over an extended period of time would be a relatively good index of a committed pair bond and predict the likelihood of provisioning, protection, and care by the father after childbirth. Not only does conception as a result of non-consensual intercourse preclude the possibility of exercising mate choice in cases of rape for females, it's unlikely that the father will care for the mother and her infant. It would, evolutionarily. This is according to the mating theory. This is not what we see in nature, but according to the mating theory, it would evolutionarily be in the female's best interest to minimize chances of conception as a consequence of rape. What that means also in a sort of unstated postscript to all of this is that preeclampsia, the condition, is dame evolution subvocalizing a disapproval of not just rape, but also incest, casual sex, and systematic polyandry. Now, these authors refer to this, but only just. Now, this obviously doesn't sound very flattering to womankind, possibly, and I agree. But this is in no way a cup panchayat advisory on polyandry. The trouble is that this is a well-established theory in the annals of uh, evolutionary biology. And I once referenced this paper in a conference on dangerous ideas at Delhi University as a part of a larger polemic. By the time I was done, I was looking at a large brimming reservoir of feminist anger and unease. I was accused of mansplaining and I was told that this theory was extremely problematic. Now, the word problematic is a wine. It's not an argument. You can attack this theory, by all means, for its false assumptions, if any, for the lack of evidence, if any, for the absence of critical rigor, if any, or its methods. But you cannot attack it because it's an unpleasant theory that isn't emancipatory to women. Objectivity, I think all of us should agree, is a value-free stance. What are observers expected to do? be even-handed with evidence or try and dress up their results to make them politically palatable? Should evolutionary perspectives be only committed to liberal causes? Only? For humans, biological predispositions and liabilities need not lead to biological destiny. I think it was the Marquis de Sade who 
who once said that it is our obligation as humans to define nature. Preeclampsia is a perfectly treatable condition with pretty good outcomes for mothers and infants. So, there are two things that uh, I think would sum up what I'm trying to say. One is that feminism is a political ideology, clearly it isn't science, which is making moral claims. And I, I insist on repeating that off-made uh, off uh, claim that the moral and political proposition of feminism, which is the advocacy of equal rights, political, social, of all kinds, for males and females, of, uh, is perhaps the most laudable project undertaken by humankind. But I think the equivalence of that moral proposition with the biological proposition that males and females are the same biologically uh, is disingenuous. So there's a moral claim that is made by feminism. And what feminist biology ends up doing is that it's making factual claims to serve as post-rationalizations for these moral claims, which I think is a dangerous project. And why I say that is because when was the last time all right, when was the last time you considered the consequences of conflating science and political ideology? Will you run out of battery or okay, yeah. Are you familiar with this man? Uh, so I'd like to end this with the story of this man. In the late 1920s, a man named Trofim Lasenko served as the head of the Soviet Union's Academy of Agricultural Scientists. He believed that the theories of natural selection, Darwin's theories and Mendelian inheritance, were all rooted in, in bourgeois values. And since they conflicted with his communist sensibilities, he denied them altogether. Next slide, please. Next. Natural selection, according to Lysenko, was a concept invented to justify competition that was characteristic of capitalism. He believed in the communist version that all living organisms are naturally cooperative. The only reason humans were competitive was because they were alienated from their natural cooperative state by capitalism. Genetic inheritance was invented justify uh, the bourgeois domination over the working classes, over the proletariat. And Lysenko very firmly believed and propagated that true inheritance was Lamarckian, which meant that all features and traits were determined entirely by nurture. He stated and propagated that there were two kinds of science. One was the capitalist science of the bourgeois hegemony that served the purposes of a socially stratified dystopia, and there was a communist science which served the purposes of a peaceful and thriving collective. And this man promoted the Marxist idea that the environment alone shapes plants and animals. So you put them in the proper setting and expose them to the right stimuli, he declared, you can remake them into almost anything. So what this man did was that he began to educate Soviet crops to sprout at different times of the year by soaking them in freezing water. He then claimed that future generations of crops would remember these environmental cues and even without being treated themselves, they would inherit these beneficial traits. So according to traditional genetics, this was a bit like uh, cutting the tail off a cat and then expecting her to give birth to tailless kitten. But what he did further was even more disastrous. He wrestled his way into the powerful Soviet hierarchy and he demanded that all farmers put his theories into practice to bring about an agricultural revolution that would bring an end to the famines caused by Stalin's collectivization. One example of this was his very firm demand, and it wasn't a demand, it was a diktat, that crops be planted ridiculously close to each other because he believed that plants would imitate the Soviet system and cooperate for survival by equally distributing water and nutrients from the soil, thus maximizing crop yields and minimal inputs of water. As you might imagine, this ended in disaster. 
It turned out that nature didn't really care about Lysenko's political views. The plants competed with each other for the scarce water and nutrients, and crop yields dramatically deteriorated under Lysenko's programs. Between 1932 and 1933, seven million Soviet peasants starved to death. Scientists who spoke out against Lysenko's theories were thrown into prison. They were accused of dabbling in the bourgeois science of natural selection. Now, I think this conflation of political ideology with science is far more dangerous than pseudoscience. And I think it should be attacked whether this kind of pseudoscience is coming from the right, from the political right, or from the political left. And these are examples of this kind of pseudoscience coming from the political left. Tem syllabi is a uh, uh, misogynist and anti-feminist because they prioritize facts over subjectivity. Science, a masculine disorder. Mathematics has been called the product of masculine linear thinking. Can there be a feminist science by Helen Longino? And in this she makes this delectable suggestion that a feminist scientific practice should be admitted, uh, should admit political considerations as relevant constraints on reasoning, which through their influence on in reasoning and interpretation should shape content. Here again, is the credo of feminist epistemology and feminist biology. That anybody trying to have objective knowledge about anything is trying to control us. There are no objective facts. All facts are infested and contaminated with moral and political doctrines. And therefore, notions of absolute truth and a single reality are masculine. And I think with this, uh, from the political left and from the political right, we have truly arrived at a juncture of post-truth. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Well, what you have said is actually scientific. I mean, to refute it is not very logical. But you have uh, spoken about the science part of it. Now, now I'm going to say something controversial, slightly more controversial. I would ask you if you could refute it. So I say that patriarchy is in part, patriarchy in part exists because it has been evolutionally selected by women. Because, for instance, women select men of higher status. Uh, another example is how the height between men and women is, has a 50% uh, overlap, but women overwhelmingly prefer males that are taller than them. Women are, uh, uh, report higher sexual satisfaction when they mate with males that are of a higher social status than them. So. What would you say? Would you, how would you refute it? Would you refute it or would, what would you say? No, no, I, I don't think you're making, uh, you're making a scientific factual claim. And I wouldn't disagree with that. Look, what I'm trying to say is this, that look, the statement of a scientific or a factual proposition should not be attacked on political ideology. So let's say I make a statement that a fat man or a fat woman riding down a hill will have more momentum and more force than a lean man or a lean woman. This is not an oppressive statement against a fat man or a fat woman. It's just a statement of fact. I don't think it should be taken as oppression. Okay, it's, it's a factual claim, not a moral claim. That's all I'm saying. I don't think the two should be conflated. Yeah, um, for yeah. me, I felt that your presentation was quite a, an example of tunnel vision. Uh, I would like to ask you a few things. Uh, one is that you mentioned about Lucy Regret's uh, quote. Can you give me the actual reference to that? Because when I checked, I found that there was no real reference to that, except that uh, in a book, somebody had mentioned about it. Do you have the actual citation for I that? Can, I can send it across to you. I'm not carrying it here. I'll send it across because to you. Because when, just... when I checked, what I found was I have read about it, and I checked about it. I found that there was no text which actually had it, but there were references to, to that in other texts, which I'm not, I don't think which should be used uh, for a presentation. The second thing that I would like to say is that when you say that science has always been object is, has always been about objectivity and uh, it has not had any kind of uh, it is not a scientific practices are purely objective. I would like to bring to your notice one example. 
because I remember reading about how when, a, uh, when uh, during birthing, uh, I've read that um, scholars have uh, come to this understanding that the first time a woman began to give birth by lying down on a bed with her legs up in the stirrups, which is bas basically the most difficult posture to give birth. And there are many other alternative methods that people use right now. But in a clinical situation, in a hospital, we still do that with women lying on the bed with the hair, legs in her stirrups. And I read that it was a king, King uh, Louis XIV or something from France, who wanted to see, uh, he had this perverse pleasure of watching his mistresses give birth. And it was for his privilege that women started giving birth in this way. So do you really think what you said about science being all about objectivity has nothing to do with patriarchy or it doesn't really favor masculine uh, power, which has been there for centuries? So, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comment. If I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to look up the reference on, on, uh, uh, on nativity and, and parturition in the lying down position. But let me tell you this. Uh, the way we do this is that, let's say there's a randomized controlled trial between childbirth in the squatting position and childbirth in the lying down position. And if the outcomes are better in the squatting position, I don't think any obstetrician is going to have any problem in having childbirth in the squatting position. That is the scientific method. It is not because it is uh, flattering to the woman or it's emancipatory or because of something. It's not, it's not like that. The scientific method, so you oppose, if you wish to oppose childbirth in the lying down supine position, oppose it on science. Call it bad science. Don't say because it's not flattering to women. That's the point I'm trying to make. You refute science by science. You make a claim, you have it tested, and if, it, if it's falsifiable, falsify it and replace it with a better theory. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I, I think I would like to disagree on that because, I'm sorry, but I would like to disagree on that because uh, I find that this is a scientific practice which hospitals follow. At least in uh, a country like India, unless you probably ask for a squatting position, I don't think it happens in any other way. And another thing is about the co use of contraceptives. It is the women who are always the, the bearers, you know, who have to submit, uh, subject their body to all kinds of pain in order to, uh, you know, uh, as part of a contraceptive uh, process. So this again is something part of science, which is which we are all doing, and still you are saying that it is it is not there is nothing to do with uh, you know female bi uh, feminine biology. I I strongly disagree with that statement. Uh, if I'm allowed to plead this, I'd like to submit that you will agree with me that uh, if there is one way uh, to improve the lot of womankind, it is to give women control over their reproductive biology. All right? And I think contraception is something that serves that cause. You are free to choose to use a contraceptive and free not to use a contraceptive, but just because contraceptives were developed by a scientific method, I don't think it would make contraception oppressive to womankind. I think there is there's a problem in, in conflating these two. I insist that there is a moral proposition, and I'm completely with you, but you have to understand the factual proposition, the biological proposition. I, I think to say that, I mean, this is a classical example of the two kinds of science which Lysenko talked about. The one that speaks for the bourgeois hegemony and the other that speaks of communist sensibilities. You're speaking the same language. There are two kinds of science. There's a, an emancipatory feminist science and there is an oppressive kind of science. And according to you, contraception falls into the oppressive science. I thought she did. What did she, what did you say? Please repeat. Uh, it wasn't, it is, I don't think I, uh, what I said falls within this binary of what you just said. Okay. Because uh, I don't believe that contraception use of contraceptive is something which addresses only the, the hegemonic class. It is something which, especially in a country like, country like India, this is something which matters, the, uh, something that is very relevant to the lives of pe women who how? belong to different sectors, segments of society. So how, how do you put that across as something which concerns only the, uh, the hegemonic bourgeois or whatever? I, I don't understand where this is going. How is biology responsible? I mean, or the scientific method responsible 
for forcing a woman to take contraception. How is, what, what is this got to do with anything? It that's a moral, that's a moral proposition, madam. I'm, I'm not is, disagreeing there. I mean, what you're trying to say is that why force women to use contraceptives and not men? I'm not disagreeing there, and that is not what I'm trying to say here. I but think that, it's disservice the, the to the The foundation of uh, developing of contraceptives itself is, you know, it rests on scientific practices, right? We are talking about scientific practices which are focused on a certain, in a certain way. It focused on the women and contraception is a responsibility of the women. No, it is not. No? No, it is not. Contraception so, has been devised to give women control over their reproductive biology. As simple as that. You're free to, to use it, you're free not to use it. I, I completely, I'm, I'm completely with the rights of women not to use it, to repudiate contraception. I'm completely with you there. And I'm not making that case. You are talking about scientific practices. And uh, scientific practices are basically, I would like to just underline the fact that scientific practices have always been, uh, in a way, uh, focused on the male, the comforts of the male. Well, uh I mean, I, I don't think... And when you, we're, we're divide, much... when you divide the moral and the, uh, the scientific, the objective and the moral, they, you're trying to create a binary which is not absolute, absolutely not there. All right, thank you. Your part on uh, pre-eclampsia, it's all good. Uh, it's very scientific. I don't refute that. But, uh, you know, uh, in retrospect, it's very uh, uh, right when you said that about pre-eclampsia. But... but Patriarchy is not something new for us. You know, it's been forever and it has been a chronic condition for humanity forever. So, you know, and then we have religions, every religions, you know, uh, you know, uh, making promiscuity and uh, polygamy uh, very unreligious. So, would you even, uh, uh, you know, is it plausible that, you know, uh, patriarchy itself uh, gave a direction to even evolution, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the female body, you know, kind of, you know, uh, uh, not accepting polygamy or would you even uh, consider that as a chance? Do you think patriarchy gave rise to gravity or our understanding of gravity? Uh, you know, look, uh, what part of my presentation do you think was in support of patriarchy? I'm sorry, I, I, I've done a a terrible job if that is, the, that is what I've managed to convey to you. I don't think that's what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying that if you're given evidence, I gave the preeclampsia example, if you have evidence as neutral observers, you handle that evidence and come to a conclusion. Whether or not those conclusions are flattering to women or men is none of your business. You're supposed to follow the evidence where it takes you and not dress up the evidence to make it politically palatable. That's all I'm trying to say. And feminist biology is is an attack on this. That's all. I'm curious to know why you got into this uh, role of uh, La Mancha, the man of La Mancha. Hello, here. Oh, hi, uh, yeah. Uh, hi. And wanted to slay feminist biology and you know bring so-called objective science into the mainstream. I'm just curious, that's number one, and then I'll go on after I hear you. Why I decided to do this? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm a surgeon, I'm a man of science, and I, I wouldn't take uh, an attack on scientific methods uh, very charitably. Okay, I am a neuroscientist, I'm a woman of science, and let me tell you, your presentation is, to use the word you said, Delhi University feminist said, problematic. And I'll tell you why I think your presentation is very problematic. Because you've picked and choose what you wanted to create your thesis and make us believe in your thesis. You know, you have incited the works of so many other people. You know, from Evelyn Fox Keller, Ruth Blair, uh, 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 you know, this person, uh, Ruth Hubbard, there's whole range, and Foster Sterling, there's so many feminist biologists who've been working on a range of issues for the past 25 years or more. You haven't quoted anybody. Right. You are just picking and choosing things okay. to show what you want. And then your uh, whatever that disease is, which I didn't quite understand, the one where the women have uh, cramps, I think. I don't understand. No, it's which, not cramps, that, it's a life-threatening disease called uh, Okay, whatever, whatever. Okay. That disease, you picked one disease and you showed something. We can give you so many other cases uh, you know, for instance, uterine fibroids, okay? What the conventional medical wisdom here in Trivandrum is, because I've done a study on it, is to say, the gynecologist tell the woman, this is, if you've had your children, your uterus can be now removed, so go right ahead and chop it off. And then they don't bother about whatever else is happening to these women. Now, there are other scientific methods, 
Like uterine fibroid, uh, fibroid em, uh, endo embolization. Embol embolization. Yeah. yeah, I do they, that for they, a living, man. There they, they are uh, all kinds of things. So what I'm trying to say, even with your your thing that you showed, for every every hypothesis, there are several multiple options. Which option do you choose is the question. And in that, there is a. Your, it's not just your gender. It's your class. It's your background. A lot of things influence the way you choose to tell the scientific story and the science. Science is a story. All right. I, I work in science, and I say that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. I accept them very humbly. Uh, in response to this, I'll say this. Your example of uterine fibroids, the scientific what the conventional practice in Trivandrum is, is, is none of my concern. The scientific method is you take a cohort of women with uterine fibroids, and if you feel that they do not require intervention, if there isn't an indication for hysterectomy, or even embolization or myomectomy, you do not intervene. That is the scientific method. What uh, you know, quacks and local practitioners in various parts of the country are doing is not a part of this. The scientific method is you test a hypothesis. If the hypothesis says that benign uterine fibroids should not be meddled with, you do that. You don't get ideology into it. And thank you for reminding me of Hans uh, uh, Fausta Sterling, uh, who is the progenitor of the dynamic uh, theory, who believes that, uh, that there's absolutely no difference in physical strength between men and women, that phenotype is a social construct. Would you agree with that? This is Anne Fausta Sterling. Thank you for reminding me, and I should have cited her, but for want of time, I didn't. Anne Fausta Sterling has also been trashed universally, ma'am. Well, uh, no, no, no. I, I mean, I, I open. I invite. I invite. I invite everyone in the audience to read Anne Fausta Sterling, and please let us know if she makes even a word of sense to you. If I may ask a question and make a comment, um, I followed your work over the years, Ambarish. I'm very interested in the things you're saying. Um, not just from a scientific perspective, I'm not a scientist, but from a feminist perspective. Um, I think there are two things happening here, which is why people are getting into locked into these kind of positions. Um, one is the science itself, and one is the power relations that exist in society. So even the fact that you are being challenged comes from science, and that science evolves, and you know there are new discoveries all the time. I think the problem is with what people do with science and their use of science as a justification to do xyz things as with gender so with race and so on i mean you know there's this famous anecdote about aristotle not knowing how many teeth women had just because he wouldn't he didn't want to do the science that would lead him to change his conclusions so i think one is that what people do with science people doctors, everybody knows perhaps a different kind of truth, but chooses not to pursue that truth. The other thing I think as a question that I would like to ask you is science changes. The things that we believed when we were growing up are now discredited, etc. Given that, can one say that, that can, one, can one kind of position science as an, as an absolute? Thank you for your comments, Annie. Uh, always welcome. And I, I'm completely with you there. I, I, am, I think this is in no way a justification of women's oppression caused by uh, the biological processes or by, uh, by any other kind of practice. And I completely agree that scientific theories are uh, subject to, to amendments, to modifications, to revisions. And I think that's part of science. And my submission here is that if you wish to attack a scientific theory, you should attack it on bad science, not on political ideology. That's the only takeaway I can offer you. You attack any theory you want, but because it lacks scientific rigor, because it's bad science, because you, don't, uh, you think that uh, scientific methodology is not being followed, and I agree with you. you know, if you feel that uterine fibroids are being removed without indication, that's bad practice. That's condemnable practice. Malpractice, I'd say. Attack it, but don't attack science because it's unflattering to you. That's all I'm trying to say. 
Hi there. Thank Hello. you. So uh, I guess my question to you is about the language that you're using in your presentation. Because as a scientist that you're claiming to be basing your ideas on, why are you using the language it's not flattering to women as if that matters? That's not scientific. You're suggesting that women's aim in life is to be flattered. But I think feminism has gone slightly beyond that. Thank, thank you for that. I, I, and, um, and, and I'm also, uh, the reason people say problematic is because they're being polite. So what that, what that means is a load of bollocks. Excuse my, <laughs> my, my bluntness. And I'm, I'm also surprised again, as an academic myself, and as you're referencing rigor, I'm absolutely amazed that you consider that objectivity a value-free stance. Because if I saw that in a very basic first-year university student essay, it would be, what do you mean by this? It would be questions. And again, it's back to your language of delivery. So although I'm not necessarily um, criticizing your, your beliefs in science, I am criti criticizing the way you deliver it, the language that you earn. Again, the, the other thing, absolute truth. Again, I'm looking for a citation because this is a huge, you know, people do years of research into absolute truth. What, who are you citing in your ideas of absolute truth? No, no, um, that, that quotation was from uh, anyway. Helen Longino, but thank you for your comments. And uh, the, f the phrase flattering to women uh, is actually being borrowed from postmodern critiques of the preeclampsia theory. So I'm, I'm using their language. Secondly, uh, and which is why I insisted on using that, that term. Secondly, uh, objectivity is a value-free stance. You would obviously penalize a first-year student in uh, gender studies for writing that. You wouldn't penalize a first-year student uh, in biology for writing that, I, or, or, or mathematics for writing that, or physics for writing that. So I think therein lies the difference between uh, you know, postmodern, post-structuralist ideas of science and knowledge, and the ones that exist in the domain of science uh, and mathematics. So, and and which is why I think there is such a big, uh, big gap here, which is very hard to reconcile. If uh, if this is quite so. Good afternoon, sir. Here. Right, sir. As far as I'm concerned, and uh, um, according to the science, science explains things, explains the phenomenon. Uh, it's not a story. Like that, uh, we are in a democratic country. The democracy does not follow the evolutionary sociology that uh, normal nature has, um, has continued. So same way, why can't the feminist uh, understand the idea, ideology of feminism uh, as an rather another um, from, from different from biology, and uh, uh, take it as a social theory and uh, apply uh, even when considering men and women are uh, biologically different. Absolutely, I agree with you. I mean, uh, to say that men and women should be equal, as I as I said, that that's a moral proposition. And it's very laudable, but to say that men and women are biologically the same doesn't make any sense. So thanks for the presentation, and I have some issues uh, with some of the things that you mentioned. Uh, you know, for example, the, uh, when you talk about science and the practice, the, you know, the practice of science is also as imp uh, very important, as somebody uh, mentioned here. You know, there's a DST report uh, which came a few years ago, uh, which looked at how many scientists are there, the proportion of scientists in a premier Indian science institute like Indian Institute of Science. And the study found that it was about 10%. Okay, only 10% of... Uh, scientists in a premier science institute uh, are women, right? So that is one uh, thing. So that, you know, if you have greater representation of women or other marginalized communities, you know, like Dalits or Adivasis, you know, you might, it's a possibility that you might have a different kind of science, given the fact that, I mean, I partly agree with your point about objectivity, but there is also this idea that, you know, the theories are underdetermined by facts. You know, we always don't have all the relevant facts before we arrive at theories, right? We work with what we have and arrive at theories. So when we work, when we arrive at scientific theories, we also, you know, our biases might come in, 
in some sense. You know, the kind of data that you look at, the kind of interpretations that you give might be influenced by some of our hidden or implicit biases. You know, so you know, it's, it's a bit arrogant, in my view, to say that you know, objectivity is, a, is something that you can have, you know, something that you can practice very clearly. Right? So that's one thing I wanted to sell, tell you. And another thing is about the Helen Longino reference you gave. Uh, and there is a point that she makes there very clearly in that article, I think. Uh, so that is, um, you know, one issue is that when you talk about one story of causality, a single story of causality, uh, you know, connecting the f uh, female hormone, I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, the chemical with the, you know, behavior, that when you talk, look at the behavior and say that this is how women behave, this is how men behave, and that's because of testosterone or estrogen or something like that. And you say that there's just a one clear connect connection between the hormone and the behavior. That is the problem. She mentioned that very clearly. You have to consider that there are psychological, ideological, all those things at work because we are all thinking beings. We are also political beings. Right? All these things also, if you want to give a complete account of behavior, you have to take in all these things into account. If a feminist chooses to take a position and be behave in a particular way, that's also you know, a, a, an object of nature. If you, are a, if you are a scientist and if you want to study objects of nature, you should also take a, keep in mind, you should also take into account you know, the driving forces, why somebody is behaving in a particular way. And uh, I would also I just end with one point. There is this study by Simon Baron Cohen, who is a psychologist who has looked at uh, autism, and the studies, uh, study showed that, you know, um, they looked at how female uh, infants, as opposed to male infants, look at, I mean, they're like newly born kids, newly born babies, right? Look at uh, pictures and, uh, you know, mechanical devices. The hypothesis was that uh, women uh, being more social would look at, uh, the, the women meaning the little babies, you know, the female infants, would look at the pictures more often than the uh, male infants, right? And the male, and they were male, both these kids were given, both these groups were given like uh, the uh, pictures as well as, you know, some mechanical mobile, right? So the hypothesis was that ma the male babies, male infants would look at the mechanical device a little more than the female infants. They got slightly, you know, uh, slight differences. I mean, it's, I don't think it was not st statistically significant result or something, but this was actually lapped up. You know, the whole scientific community, I mean, at least in that area, you know, which looked at the autism studies and so on, they kind of took it as a very serious result and made a big thing out of it and claimed that, you know, uh, little uh, girls are like very social and little boys are very mechanically inclined and so on. So that is perhaps an example of bad science, you know, as you pointed out. You know,